Welcome back to another episode of Add, Edit, and Delete. As business owners who have generated hundreds of millions in revenue, we're here to share our experience to help other business owners based on our learnings, and we bring in guests that we can learn from together. My name is Mike Ford. I'm joined by my partners, Mark and Cody, and we have a very special guest in here today. His name is Brandon, and he's uh, really done a great, developed a great career for himself in commercial real estate, uh, one ever developing career, I'm sure. Um, but why don't you give us in the audience just a little bit of a history on how you ended up getting there? Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Excited to be here with the with the buddies. Um, how did I get started? I started. Uh, I was playing football. I was playing football professionally, very briefly. And, you know, when I would get cut in between uh, those sessions, between, you know, being on a team, being off a team, I would do personal training. And I built that business up. And, uh, you know, that was very successful. But at the same time, you know, there's a ceiling to that. You can only do so many sessions in a week. You only charge so much. So, you know, even if you max it out entirely, this is how much you're going to make a year. And... Yeah. So I just thought a lot about that and thought a lot, uh, you know, about, you know, that's sales, you know, get bringing people in the door. So what can I sell that's a higher dollar amount per hour, you know, so I'm not having to do a hundred hours a week in order to feel like successful in it. And so I went to Australia, you know, got my mind off everything, did nothing business wise for six months, played Australian world's football. Talk to a bunch of you know sales companies, whether it be medical sales, commercial sales, marketing, and I landed in commercial real estate as just a you know an apartment broker selling apartment mm -hmm. buildings, old 1970s, 1950s, um, 20, 30 unit apartment buildings, and kind of took off from there. It was really cool, you know, just with a, a sports background, really competitive background. When, when you enter the business world, you know you're competing against guys who you know typically wake up at you know, nine o'clock in, in the morning and want to you know grab drinks every single day or just you know they're just not attacking it the exact same way as a very small you know percentage of people in the world are and so that was really exciting you know that like I just competed against the highest at like best athletes in the world the ones who took everything so seriously and then coming into a field where it just, it, it well, just especially like, yeah. commercial real estate too, mm -hmm. right? That's an awfully notorious social scene. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk a lot about, and did in our first couple episodes, just the grind, right? Like reels, everything on social media is talking about quick uh, $20,000 a month and Amazon storefronts and like how easy it is to make money. That has not been our experience. Doesn't sound like it's been yours as far mm -hmm. as the discipline, right? And just staying, using those same uh, frameworks you use to get yourself to an elite level athlete and applying those in business, right? It, it takes hard work. And mm -hmm. we say if hard work works when we're talking to salespeople and not putting in the reps and things like that. Yeah, it's uh, that's why I like hiring athletes. It's why you like hiring athletes and that's how we both carved out a lot of equity for ourselves in the in business is being persistent and being on time and being early. But I think, and this is something I've been I've been going back and forth with, like, why am I successful? Out of all these people, why am I successful? And a, a lot of it I attribute to college football. And when you go into college football, you're 18, you don't know anything other than mom and dad, and they have a hard, uh, they cut you off for mom and dad. Moms are crying and they, coaches are pushing the moms out of the, the apartment building where they're two weeks early. Remember Kevin Miller? We, we got kickers crying, right? <laughs> you know, our kickers and punters are crying. It, it, but what, oh what, you, what you do, it, there's a system. And it's, this, it's similar to the military going into college football. They want you molded into a certain individual that's going to perform the way that you want. So they break you down. They break you down physically, mentally. And then they rebuild you back up physically and mentally. And then they, you're, you come out once you're done with sports um, into this mold that's in their eyes the way they wanted you and then a lot of guys struggle with that they don't know what to do afterwards um, same thing with the military right you're you're built up a certain way they break you down and that's all you know and then all yep. of a sudden hey your service is done hey you're done playing sports good luck and a lot of guys struggle with that and 
where guys excel is taking in that and channeling that, how you've been rebuilt, rebranded in, in the image of a college football coach or system or military, and then contributing that to the workforce, which is why so many sales guys, consultants are athletes. Yeah. And uh, so Brandon, you did a, like you talked a little bit about that uh, personal training business, right? Where you're, that's trading your time for money and you couldn't scale. There's only so much time in a mm -hmm. day. That's essentially an employee mindset. I'm going to trade my time to help you grow your business at this particular function. That, that hit a point for you where you were like, no, I want the value of my contribution and my skill and my discipline to be me rewarding me with a net profit number. Mm -hmm. What you saw, you must have seen some of those, you know, expectations on profitability, and you were that person trading your time to help them create that. Mm -hmm. What, what, what helped you take that leap of faith to do it yourself? Well, help me. Um, I just think thinking about everything is a game and you're just trying to learn that game and applying those prints, the same principles throughout and just figuring out how to win at that game. There's really not a lot of uh, differences between any sort of business. And right. that's why you have so many guys all the time say, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I wasn't the smartest guy. I didn't have the the best skill set and that's like this consistent message you hear on every podcast on every book you, like everyone wants to talk about it and it's true because it is just figuring out a game and then mastering your craft in any Stick sport it to your yeah. plan mm -hmm. sports music uh business you know anything science is just master your craft learn every single angle, every single lever that can be pulled, what this does. If you do this over here, what it does over here. If I wake up early and I do this and apply these principles, it was successful here, it's gonna be successful here. And it's very rare to have, I can't think of many businesses where that you know, isn't the case. And uh, you bring up something that, you know, sometimes context is important, right? So you talk about coming in and not everyone's as disciplined as you are. Uh, I'll have imposter syndrome sometimes, right? Because we, I have a formula, I have a framework, I get the data, I make a decision, it works, we add, edit, and delete all day long in our businesses. And that discipline and skill brings a certain level of success and you build on that. And then just that rep created the better next rep, right? Um, when you have the context of people that are not putting in that same level of discipline, that's actually creating that differentiation, right? So that's, I think, what maybe feeds that imposter complex because I'm only doing what is the right thing to do and I'm doing it a lot, but I'm doing it better or making more money or doing this because other people aren't taking that same heightened approach to, uh, a drive for excellence. Mm -hmm. It's really about like it, a lot of it starts from a drive for excellence, not mediocrity, right? In commercial real estate now, yeah. right? Uh, I think there's different definitions of commercial real estate. Commercial real estate could be the skyscrapers and of a skyline and class A buildings. There's commercial real estate that is retail. Uh, lifestyle centers are popular now. There's plazas that are you know, great little money makers. And then there's uh, residential complexes that might be the the apartment units you've been talking about, but it's actually residential versus business businesses that are paying the rent. How do you define and select commercial real estate opportunities? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, I mean, I, I just consider commercial real estate anything outside of just a, a house, a single you know, family, a single home. family home, and it, it's income producing. It's just trying to maximize the potential of an asset, and so you know the fact that it's a physical asset. There are details that you know matter with it being a physical thing, but at the same time, um, a lot of it's done on paper, right? And a lot of it is you know an Excel spreadsheet, and um, in the process and a formula if I do X, Y, and Z to this property, whether it's apartments, whether it's office, whether it's retail, whether it's a strip mall, 
land, vacant land, entitled land, whatever it may be, if I just follow this process and generally it will, you know, it will work out the physical asset. There might be a couple things um, there that can be tweaked or that will change the model a little bit, but you know, otherwise it's, you don't, you don't, it, it, it's just a, it's a piece of paper. What about the old adage, location, location, location? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the formula, right? Yeah. So that's one of your little, inputs yeah. for your. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like, so, okay, let's say we're, you know, in, in downtown LA, the buyer pool is that much greater. Thus the competitiveness for that asset is that much greater. And you know, so the price is going to be higher because more people want it. Um, you can have that exact same building an A-class quality building in Wichita, Kansas, and you're going to have less people. So it's going to, you know, wanting it or at the, you know, desiring it. So you're going to have a you price. Know, price yeah. It's going to be priced differently. And so I think again, like you can probably take that into any other business. If the buyer pool is big, the price goes up, if the buyer pool small price goes down. Um, and so, yeah, you use certain techniques, you know, certain finishes, certain, uh, you try to get certain tenants in, um, you try to lower risk of the buy, you know, for the buyer and you just pull on these levers, you know what the levers are, you try to pull on them and create this package to sell to an investor. And I think a lot of people can, uh, correlate that to their business. What, uh, what is your favorite? You know, I like working on apartment buildings. And so, um, Cody and I, uh, we own a few apartment buildings out in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. That's what I cut my teeth selling as a junior broker. And, you know, the biggest thing with commercial real estate and apartment buildings specifically is, um, your clients are also your mentors. Like the guys I'm selling properties to and hoping uh -huh. to make a little commission off of, those are the, you know, I'm watching them. I'm hearing their techniques. I'm seeing what they do. I'm seeing, you know, when I sell it to them, this is the steps they take. And then I'm selling that property again, three years later. And this is the, you know, this the is outcome. the money they made. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, picking their, <clears throat> you know, in a lot of companies, how many layers are there between the low guy and the hundred millionaire, you know, a hundred million dollar guy in that. And so I thought that was the best part of the business. Um, you know, just being, you know, empty pockets, but talking to the guy that's stroking the seven, eight, nine, ten million dollar checks as an just as an individual. So I've worked with a lot of um, mom and pops, like you know, personal capital people that just you know created wealth in real estate and mostly in apartments. And so that's what I do. Uh, and we've done that in a short amount of time. We've mm -hmm. created a huge amount of wealth for ourselves. And. I'm nothing more than a guy with some money that can help you out, right? And what Brandon does and what mm -hmm. I thought was really unique and what we've done, and I would drive around and we'll drive around through Coeur d'Alene and he'll see a, an apartment complex and I'll tell him the address and he'll write it down and then he'll go and find it through your software that you have and he'll start calling on it. So these these properties are not something that's listed on the market that he's finding. He's digging them up. He's cultivating his nice. own leads and it's impressive and just like on the way here, right? Uh, he was working, a, he's currently working a client and his junior broker says, hey, he's on his anniversary, don't call him. Brandon goes, I'm gonna text him happy anniversary, right? Just like that little extra, just to get in yep. that guy's ear, just, you know, hey, I'm thinking about you, I'm not gonna bug you today, but it's really good. And that's where we've done well. And so when you're looking at for properties, what are you looking for when we're driving around out there? Yeah, just like a little bit of distress. I mean, with it being a physical asset, you can kind of see if it's, if it's, you know, good or not. You know, if there's you, at a certain point, you can tell if someone's owned something for a long time, there's some deferred maintenance. Uh, you just can see opportunity being as it's physical. You know, when you're, evalu when you're buying businesses, you really got to dig in and um, look through their records. Whereas with a, you know, piece of property, you can kind of just be like, oh, that siding is kind of screwed up or that roof's, you know, not great. Or you see the people outside, you know, those are kind of low quality and you just see there's value, like you can see the value creation there. And so if there's any inkling of that, if there's anything like that and the area is great and you see everything kind of thriving around it, you're just like, all right, I'm gonna write that address down and dig in and see if I can be like a beacon of help to the, whoever owns that now, you know? Yeah. And that's the positioning, right? Like, let me try and help you either co-create value or create value for your own individual self. Mm -hmm. And I'll take all the hard work and create value for myself. 
Yeah. Mark, you're in a couple of uh, multiplex units. Yeah. yeah. What's your experience been? It's been good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all right. I've had real estate, you know, for a while. So um, I'm, I manage it myself. It's pretty simple. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. Nothing crazy. What about, so I've got um, one uh, rental property that is a seasonal uh, place and I do weekly or monthly rentals. And to be honest, given the complexity of some of the businesses that we're doing at an individual level, it's kind of a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, and I have a hard time giving away 15% for something that's going to sell itself. So I end up taking on that work. When you're evaluating your buildings and your location, Coeur d'Alene is a resort town, yeah. right? How do you take that cost benefit analysis into an Airbnb type of situation right. versus I've got this, like, I'm just going to get a monthly and I'll give away a little margin, but mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to spread my wings further. Right. Yeah. You try to buy it and price it where, you know, there's that room where, you, you know, worst case scenario, right? you look at a worst case scenario. Okay. We're going to make this, you know, we're going to make some money here. And then you just try to build from there. We went the Airbnb route on a few units and we were making, significantly more but we're also taking 20 more phone calls on it and we're just like well this hour and a half that i'm spending on this you know it's not worth the six seven eight hundred more dollars that i'm getting on uh you know yeah. on a unit per month you know so it, it yeah you just kind of try to just it depends on your, your level right yeah like uh, where we're at, we have enough real estate where it's a pain in our side and we got other stuff going on. But if, you know, like what you're doing though, Mike, that house there on the beach in a sought after spot, it, it's worth it. You want it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, nope. Love staying in it though. Uh, you yeah. know, the other thing about real estate too, for me, it's a, uh, it's a tax play, right? So I'm, uh, I've got a depreciating, a, a depreciation thing that I can play there. I've got uh, deductions Expenses. that can go into the improvements. Um, and I get the mortgage deduction while I'm waiting for an appreciation, right? So it's in it. That's it's not as much of a wealth creation play as a tax mitigation yeah. play. And uh, it's also a pretty safe just where you buy in these uh, high demand areas. I'm I'm 60 days from cash out, right? Right. So that's another yeah, it's aspect liquid. of the mm -hmm. evaluation. Yeah, I think real estate is the best uh, bank account that you can have. You know, and I think you hit the nail on the head. If it's in a really good location, you can exit it. You know, you might not maximize your profit profit to it. You can go, but you can go do it again, and it's okay. Um, a lot of people get very uh, emotionally attached to these properties when they really are just bank accounts. Um, but that's my favorite part is just how many variables in it, it, it helps. Like it helps in a tax, it helps in a tax wise, as you've, you know, seen, we've done the cost segregation studies and just like all of a sudden we're taking a loss while we're making a lot of money. Um, yeah. And you roll that loss forward over a five year mm -hmm. study. Yeah, yeah. That's huge. So yeah, you have your tax benefits, you have your cash flow from the property, you have your, uh, equity increasing and you know appreciation and then you know you can refinance it too and take out your equity and it's tax free and you can go kind of replicate it one day it's gonna you're gonna have to pay hey, uncle, sam. Yeah, uncle sam but <laughs> just like kind of you're, you're doing that with any anything you're not gonna escape that so um that's that's been our you know our thing there's been if we make no money in cash flow if we sell it for what we bought it for we still have these benefits yeah and so yeah what uh do you have a point of view on rates for the next 6 12 18 months right yeah i'm the one that, <laughs> i'm the one that knows uh, i think that you know i think i'm just kind of follow the general crowd and we're not going to buy anything based on the future of rates and if they go down that's amazing um but we're buying for what they are today and right now they're they're not great so we're pricing that in um but i mean i kind of side with everybody else that they're going to come in this year and it's just a generally a, a better feel to the market it's been a, a while you think the election, recession you know do you think the election 
affects that. Yeah, for sure, right? What was the last one? That was like when rates dropped to, by then, it was like 2.8%, maybe in that time frame. Do you so. buy into that springboard theory that once they drop, that uh, asset values will actually oh, yeah. exponentially grow? Because people have already, they've been pricing based on six, seven, and like, oh, I can afford this much mortgage. Mm. Now that drops, so now that's going to actually uh, affect the appreciation of the asset. Yeah, I'd like to think so. I mean, it's in a commercial real estate and in income producing property, it for sure makes sense. You know, it's like if rates are five, then you need to sell it at a seven percent return just for that delta that you know you're selling income producing or you know income producing properties that are investment properties. So you need to make some sort of return and provide it. But and so if rates drop to three, well then your return is going to drop to a five, thus making your um, asset worth more. And, you know, and then same thing for residential. Now that monthly um, monthly interest payments are going to drop, that buyer pool, again, is just going to come expand. out, you know, expand. You know, not everyone can afford a $6,000 a month mortgage on a $700,000 home, and that's like a normal home right now. So the minute that drops down to three, then people are paying that as a part, you know, for their apartment rentals, and they'll be able to make that work. And so it's just more people to the table more competitive environment and prices are going to go up for that reason. We also nice. like to ask what's the hardest part about what you do? <laughs> what's the part that you kind of say, did I like, I would say for me on any given day, any given month, there's a 20 minute period where I'm like, what, why did I take on all this responsibility? Right. Uh, and when does that occur? And it's you for me. It's generally people driven. People yeah. whining about this or that, or or dishonesty, or they say they're going to do one thing, then they don't, or they just, uh, you know, yeah, one hundred percent. It's people, and so just trying to align yourself with good people is the biggest thing. You know, I own my own brokerage now, and I won't like I could hire a hundred <laughs> brokers and capitalize on all of them, and you know, collect fees on them, but I don't want to be around them, you know, all day, every single day. So we, I only have. 10 brokers um, at my company and it's kind of going to stay that way until I meet another good guy that or girl that wants to come on and work hard and is aligned with us and creates our value. You know, we have the infrastructure to bring on as many people, but I just don't want, I don't like a lot of people, you know, right. I don't trust a lot of people. So trust, yeah. right. Trust is a big part of that. Yeah. We've always had a rule that 10 is the max as far as one manager mm -hmm. span of control. Mm hmm. And it's That's absolutely true. You start yeah. getting over 10, you know, it's harder to keep a hold of it. So finding someone you can delegate to is so important. So someone you trust, someone you can delegate to, someone who's on the same level and same mindset. But in, in doing that, right, is how do you keep uh, a, an A player real estate agent around, right? Because you you were an A player. You Your first job, you climbed to the top, and then you got poached to another real estate firm. You mm -hmm. climbed to the top of that. You ran that for those guys. Right. And you were like, hey, I have got the keys to the castle. I know what I'm doing now. Uh, I'm ready to go start it myself because you were doing everything, right? right? Yeah, and yeah. You built, you know, and that when you are doing everything and you're making someone a lot of money, it builds resentment. A little bit, right? And same for you, right? You did that, you know, at the company prior, and what made you stay was just right. He, you got some of it. You got more of, you know, the work you put in. You were rewarded for it, and uh, I think when it becomes unweighted. You know, people are, are a lot of people are loyal. Like a lot of people, it's like in their DNA to be loyal. But once they feel taken advantage of and that resentment starts building, then it's really easy to sever ties and, and then be like, oh, I see what you're doing. <clears throat> I can do that. And I'm going to go do that. And so yep. just not being greedy when you're at the top, not using people um, when you're at the top and letting them grow with you and take responsibility off of your shoulders. Um, I think it's huge because you know that frees you up you don't the people who you know the people who hug too tightly and hold too tightly are the ones who end up you know killing the baby right <laughs> so, <laughs> so. well when i um left corporate america and started to you know entertain thoughts of the consulting environment and being on my own i got some really good advice about just keep because there's so many permutations and trying to keep this thing going as far as what is the right decision to go forward. And it was just think about learning and earning. 
And what, how are those things indexing? And if you're learning at a really high rate, but even the money's not there, then it's probably still okay. Mm. Or those things start to switch. You're earning a ton, but you're not learning. That's not going to be as rewarding long term. If they're both index, like for us, they were both indexed really high for a really long time with mm. the learning and earning. Um, but I think that's a really good, simple way to look at how good is your day going? Am I learning and am I earning at a rate that can keep up with you know the lifestyle that I expect for myself, my family, accumulation of wealth with expectations that I've set for myself? Mm. Uh, but it's but it's pretty simple, right? And I think the way we challenge ourselves is trying to build stuff that we've never really built before, but we have enough reps in other businesses. To your earlier point, right? where we have a lot of confidence that we have the right formulas to apply them in a new vertical or a new sector or even just uh, building out a new department, right? That just takes a body of work, aligns it to human resources in a staffing structure that will be efficient and have accountability, right? So Yeah, which plays into the add, edit, delete, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what we've, and that's our concept and that's our podcast because that's what we've, done yeah and you're going through that right now on on restructuring and, and building constantly building yeah. no absolutely i mean like so you know i was a broker i was a really good broker a top producing broker and but i wasn't a business owner and so you know for a year and a half i wasn't making any money as a business owner i was still brokering deals buying deals uh making money that way but like you know six months I was like, ago i was like i need to figure out how to make money on like my actual business and uh so yeah exactly like i was learning all all along and i felt good about my business and uh and now it's starting to come around now that my focus is on it i'm trying to apply certain things i've learned here and move it over there yep yeah it's all uh i love what you said too about uh looking at clients as mentors too right because it's always about consistent learning and you're, you're putting in the reps that are increasing the skill and that becomes more and more refined every time. And it's just about uh, hard work, discipline, and staying excited about the grind, right? Which is what I think. That's what, hard. Right? That's a hard part. Yeah. <laughs> Motivate yourself. Motivate on that, yep. right? On yep. that. I think we've got to get Psych motivated. Uh, we're going to uh, nice go, steak dinner tonight. Go put down a steak, yeah. You're Steak dinner portions. and then a hockey game. Yeah, yeah, in a suite. Right. Sweet. Yeah, I've never, I've never been to. I've been to one hockey game, but we're in the three hundred level, and I, I don't know Here the uh, hockey team in Los Angeles. I forget oh. the name of it, but it was, it was, <laughs> it was miserable. I, the seats are so small up in the three hundred level that I had to sit down in a seat and put my legs in a seat in front of yeah. me. I'm six five. Brandon's six six, and. It just wasn't. It was miserable. Big Absolutely guy problems. Miserable. Big guy problems. Everybody around me is fighting the whole time. I'm trying to figure out where the puck's at. The puck is so yeah, hard to track. My yeah. first, but yeah, I got yelled at the first time I went to a hockey game because I was standing up during the ice time and I was in the way. I was like, get the fuck out. <laughs> Where's your mute button? Brandon, well, Mike's a big hockey guy. He's yeah, both of us. That Bauer hat. Your kids play, right? Yeah, I coach yeah, them. Brandon great. still plays hockey. Damn, Picked Brandon. Up, yeah. How are your hips? No, oh, I'm I'm feeling it. For sure. <laughs> yeah, he's like a goalie, which is he is he has some of the best hands. And he was, I think you still have some records to this day. You have one record, one record, left. one record that Cooper Cup didn't break. Yeah, one record. He broke I, all of them. I saw <laughs> I saw your big uh, thing up at the Inferno. Oh you yeah, had a, a whole chain link dedicated to Brandon Kaufman. Away. It's Can't so crazy because Brandon was the most prolific player that. Eastern had seen and could catch any deep ball you ever threw to him. Broke all the records. And then you get a guy like Cooper Cup. Yeah, Cooper Cup who comes in, Kendrick Bourne. And then it's overshadowed the greatness that Brandon was, which is crazy because he was so dominant, so dominant. It was every play I would line up and I would block the guy in front of me. I would stay in and block on the back end or I would run out in a seam and I knew I didn't even look back at the quarterback because I knew they were going to throw it to me. It was, my job was to go down there, draw in a safety, and then go celebrate with Brandon <laughs> in the end zone. And half the time you couldn't catch him. He'd already by the time they were done celebrating, I just got down there huffing and puffing. And 
I used to get so mad because Brandon, yeah. Nick Edwards, and Greg Hurd would never stick around. Allow never you. stick around. I would be down there blocking. <laughs> I get it. I'm a glorified O lineman at tight end, but I would go down there for like, hey, good job, and they'd already Nothing. be celebrating oh. on the side. Oh, it was miserable. The life. <laughs> I, it's, a, it's tough being a tight end. The O lineman. You're not really yeah, an O lineman. Yeah, you're not yeah. a wide receiver. You're just kind of by yourself. <laughs> But, yeah, let's go get a steak. Yeah, Mm -hmm. thanks for joining us. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you for watching another episode of Ad, Edit, and Delete. Small business owners helping small business owners scale correctly. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe.